and I'm really delighted to have uh, you on board and many of the authors, or at least some of the authors of the book that we are uh, editing together and, and writing. Uh, this is the, the international track of Mital and the session focus on hybrid learning spaces. Uh, we are uh, live on YouTube, just to say, and the, the, the session is being recorded. Um, I, I met quite, a, a, I met some of you in the in emails and during the, okay. the book editing, which is still in a manuscript uh, uh, form. We hope to send it uh, just uh, next week. And uh, we have uh, in this session, um, a seven presentation, uh, seven out of uh, the 17 uh, book chapters on hybrid learning spaces, which is, this book is, a, is especially in a way that it's, a, it's multi, uh, it, multidisciplinary. It comes from architecture, uh, learning design, education, anthropology. So we, we are going, we're aiming at, um, at a broad sense, in a broad sense of uh, hybridity and hybrid in spaces, and, and this you'll see uh, with the presentation. Just uh, a few comments um, that uh, we have really tight schedule, and, and we are already a bit late, but um, we have uh, eight minutes for each presenter, uh, six uh, dedicated for the presentation and two for questions. So if you have questions, uh, please write them in, on the chat, in the chat and uh, or wait to, to the two minutes the question and then raise your, head, your hand. Um, if you can uh, mute, your, uh, uh, mute uh, the, boy, the, the audio and if the presenter can unmute themselves in, in their session. Um, other than that, um, just to say that it's a, it's a long process. The, the book editing, uh, it's already almost two years, Ishai, Yanis, and uh, Christian, and um, uh, we are all together in the editing. And I'd like uh, uh, to, pre to, pre to invite the first presenter, which is myself, uh, to, uh, this is, uh, so I, I'll need to um, uh, keep, maybe Ishai, you'll, you'll help me keep the time. Um, just to say that most of the presenters sent us a, a video, so it's a, a pre-recorded the video, and then the session of question and answer will be live. Uh, apart from, I think, John that is presenting uh, live. Uh, so uh, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Liat Yal and myself. Um, I'm the head of uh, uh, learning. This is. It's confusing. I'm the head of uh, uh, learning uh, innovation uh, and design uh, in the Kibbutzim College of Education. Liatial, who is in another session uh, in parallel, could be here. She's from the Vinci College of Education. So you can play the. Hello, my name is Einat, and I'll be talking today about the threefold perspective of hybrid learning spaces. This presentation is based on a chapter mutually written by Liat Eyal and myself. But first, few questions to be asked. What is hybridity? What are hybrid learning spaces? Does the term that has entered our life so broadly has numerous meanings? So in looking at the involvement of the term in the literature together with our own thinking, we'd like to offer three meanings. Hybrid as blended, hybrid as a space of merging interactions, hybrid as fluid. Let's start from the historical roots, uh, hybrid as blended. Blended and hybrid learning often appear as interchangeable or synonymous terms. Hybrid or blended learning refers to the combination of face-to-face -face learning, including but not confined to lectures and online learning. These are courses in which a significant amount of the learning activities has been moved online. The purpose of hybridity is to reduce class seat time and sometimes to promote active independent learning. 
The term hybrid appears to imply a somewhat technical change in study methods. In most, most cases, it preserved classical pedagogy. Thus, hybrid has blended focus on the place and time dimension of learning. The second meaning moves away from the so-called mixture of face-to-face -face versus online towards a compound, which we named hybrid as a space of merging interactions. Hybrid spaces are dynamic spaces created by the constant movement of users who carry portable de devices, which are continuously connected to the internet and other users, says De Sosa. It relates to the state of being always on, that frequently adds a social dimension to the learning experience. Thus, hybridity is manifested in a combination of three overlapping spaces, mobile, social and physical spaces. Coppe, Nogard and Patterson relate to hybrid education by using design patterns to cut across traditional dichotomies which education such as physical, digital, academic, non-academic, online, offline, thus add another scaffolding layer to the learning. Hybrid as fluid is yet another meaning. Stommel described hybrid pedagogy as holistic entity bridging different dichotomies such as performed selves versus real selves, learning in schools versus learning in the real world. In his term, hybrid pedagogy, hybridity is about the moment of play, in which the two sides of the binary begins to dance around and through one another before landing in some new configuration. It is the learning choice that crosses boundaries rather than being limited with constraints. The choice is the result of individual motivation to go beyond a platform, a student role, or a space of learning dictated by institutions or prescribed rules. In a like manner, fluids neither fix space nor bind time, suggests Bauman, describing the characteristic of this era. Fluids are constantly able to change form and thus adjusting to space over time. Such is hybrid learning at present. Thus, in summary, in hybrid as blended, hybridity is rooted in the somewhat physical location. In hybrid as emerging interactions, it is rooted in the environment with additional impact of mobile and social aspect. As to hybrid as fluid, it is, in its holistic, immersive essence, hybridity is rooted in a learner's autonomous identity that bridges or can bridge all boundaries. Thank you. So if there are any questions, comments, uh, please ask. I'm sure that uh, you witnessed that my English uh, is not as fluent as my Hebrew, but uh, nevertheless, I managed to come across. Um, okay, if, if no questions, so we will be ahead of time for the next presentation. No, can you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Sure. Could you yeah. elaborate a bit about the hybrid as fluid in the practical sense? What does it mean? <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for the questions. It, it is um, hybridity uh, in, in this fluid sense is all around us. I think uh, we see it, uh, especially in this time of the, the COVID-19, where if someone actually would like to study and uh, so there's no, li no limitation to what can be done. So in the sense, uh, the formal and the informal uh, bridges and uh, the role of a student or a, a teacher. So a student can become a teacher or an expert or a, a move from uh, within and without uh, and from different platform. Uh, for myself, I, I witnessed it uh, as, a, as a professor in, uh, in, in my teaching where um, I taught a course and I saw how a student 
come uh, go all the way with their uh, in the car it was in the COVID-19 they go with their car and we follow them in a there was a, le a guest lecture actually of Anat Moravi who is one of the authors uh, and is here and we saw how this uh, student uh, in the class come uh, through the car and go up the elevator and participate and ask questions and then also uh, implement the, what she learned um, in her school as an expert. So she bridges all kinds of uh, boundaries in the, in the one uh, journey as, as a learner, as an actor or teacher, as an expert. Thank you. Okay. So if there's no any other questions, we'll move uh, to the, the second presentation um, of uh, uh, John Cook and Debbie Holly. Uh, John is a professor at Gotha U uh, University in Frankfurt and uh, Debbie is a professor of uh, Bonn Bonnemouth uh, University. And they will be speaking about COVID-19 lockdown, hybrid learning cases using the lens of the zone of possibility. Uh, great, thank you, uh, Ainat. Uh, that was a great talk um, uh, and greetings, everyone. So, yeah, I'm John Cook, I'm an academic, um, father, I like to play double bass and go hill walking. Um, so, in, in terms of the, my eight minutes, six, it actually is six minutes, but it's just I dwell on some references at the end. Yushe, shall I play it or will you play it? Uh, it, it do you want me to play the, the video? Yeah, uh, it's up to you. Do you is, is that the format? I've got it lined up if you want. Yeah, so, so go ahead if you're if you're ready to yeah. then, then shoot. Hello, my name's John and uh, I'm presenting a talk on COVID lockdown, hybrid learning cases uh, using the lens of zone of possibility. Uh, it's gonna, this talk is um, written with uh, Debbie Holly. Um, so it's going to be a brief one, under eight minutes now, and so quickly saying what it talks about. We looked at um, the concept called the zone of possibility, which I'll define in a minute, and we frame our hybrid, hybrid learning space pedagogy through um, three cases, which are listed there. And the research question that drove us was um, what, um, uh, in the context of hybrid learning spaces, how can the design process and design thinking advance or bridge successful communication and an understanding of the social context in as well. Um, so these are the key concepts I want to, uh, need to get across to you. Um, we positioned our work along the axis, um, two axes of um, pedagogical theory and uh, practice. We looked at implications derived from these three diverse case uh, studies that were um, came about through the lockdown and the COVID pandemic um, used an educational design research uh, paradigm to drive us and so a zone of possibility is a place where individuals can overcome the constraints of expectations and power structures to affect uh, desired change and in terms of hybrid learning spaces we looked at the contrast between formal and informal learning the physical the digital Con key concepts, again, space and place, and, and I'll talk about this in the conclusions, interpenetration. We were particularly interested in bridging, uh, e.g. where a tutor is putting a student in a study group so that they can get the best out of the circumstances in a way that they couldn't uh, get out of things normally. The first case study was Bristol Jazz Workshop, and this was an informal learning in the community, involved about 10 participants, and uh, I acted as the observer and the participant. I'm a double bass player as well, so I was involved in that. Uh, there's music in the slides uh, and the paper, which I'll give the link to at the end, which you could listen to. The second case study was at um, Goethe University Frankfurt, where I'm a tutor. Um, students, I teach four courses, short courses every uh, year. Um, students went online and when COVID hit, with me, we used on this occasion Adobe Connect. Um, so there were formal learning, 12 participants were in the face-to-face -face in 2019, and seven participants fully online in 2020, and I compared the two in the case study. Um, the, the concept, it was looking at digital learning, so, uh, and um, 
the Bournemouth University case study, the third case study uh, involved, was a semi-formal learning context with uh, 62 nurse tutors in the first instance cascaded to five departments. through them but in particular I'm going to go through these now a bit at a slower pace uh, to try and um, tease out what we found. First of all we, we improved our meta uh, design principle uh, using a template based on work I've done with Yishe Moore uh, in Cook et al 2020 the references at the end of these slides and in particular we call this design principle uh, meta design principle respect the learners zone of possibility now these meta design principles take that particular approach shown there, where we have a description of it, theoretical background, and then right, link right through to practice in terms of tips, challenges, limitations, trade offs, pitfalls. So there's a particular structure we're following there, and the idea is that you can take this meta design principle and use it in other contexts because of the way we've written it, but you can also explain what's going on because we provide links to and from theoretical backgrounds. Um, all cases illustrated this notion of interpenetration. And I think this is an important concept, I and others do, in terms of hybridity and the need, it needs more work in terms of, and it links back to the design thinking aspect of our research question that I posed in the, um, the beginning. And it was interesting in case study one, uh, when Fred, um, did when his son, he was recording his um, saxophone part for, a, we put the music online, I helped com, uh, sort of compile it. Everyone had to compose their parts individually in their homes. So we were getting this kind of confluence of uh, people doing their leisure at home, learning from home, and maybe working from home. So this is, we get this kind of interpenetration between the two, this hybridity. What happened when Fred was recording his saxophone part is his son burst into the room to ask him a question. Uh, and um, Fred just kept playing his solo and recording it and pointed to the door and you can hear his son on the recording of his studio saying why why so you've got a real idea of kind of the mixture from what's going on there in terms of interpenetration in case study three interpenetration took place between the material and the virtual uh, it became the norm as students who were actually nurse nurses um, you know, about to go into practice and staff learn very quickly to harness their mobile devices to access learning on the move in the complexity of different spaces. Um, so we've got that idea of hybridity coming to come into the fore. Uh, bridging, bridging digital literacies um, was important in all the case studies and sometimes problematic. In the, um, in the, in the, the Bristol Jazz Workshop case study, uh, we had Participants uh, had to um, record their own musical parts at home and then send them to me, and I compile them using so called using some uh, software, Adore Digital Audio Workstation called Ableton Live 10. I've got, and uh, I compile them all layer by layer. One one chap, a saxophone player, found that he got the best results by recording his saxophone part in his wardrobe, which was quite amusing. So you got the real uh, interpenetration there between. Um, you know the physical and the digital but you've also got the people learning these digital literacies for in an informal context of how to how to move forward in terms of recording uh, their parts here are some selected references this year you can cut me off here this is far, this is, um, this, is, this will give us a bit of time for if there were any questions thanks for that this year. um any questions don't expect me to sing any songs or play any tunes Thank, yeah. you, thank you, John. And thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, uh, we'll move to uh, Morten Winter Budo. Uh, Morten is a PhD fellow at the Danish School of Education, Eras University, who will be speaking about designing synchronous hybrid learning spaces, challenges, challenges and opportunities. And just in terms of, uh, uh, you can also already upload the uh, shine if you want. And uh, for the uh, people from participants from Israel and um, the term hybrid synchronous uh, teaching or learning 
is um, in Israel we call it the uh, high flex classes. So this is a term that is really popular in Israel, but in different terms, which I think is not the correct term. Yeah, thank you. Synchronous hybrid learning spaces can be designed in many ways. This illustrates what might be the most straightforward type. A student takes part in formal learning where part of the group is present in the same classroom while she joins in online using a fellow student's computer. In this presentation, I'm going to share the results from a research on how does synchronous hybrid teaching challenge and support the learning whole seen as the combination of the set design, the social design and the epistemic design dimensions. By doing that, I hope that I'll be able to contribute to the formulation of principles supporting innovative activity-centered learning design principles. To answer the question, I've conducted a review focusing on research published in the period from 2019 until early 2021. And uh, to triangulate the findings in the review and to update them, I've conducted an analysis of Danish college teachers' written reflections during the transformations made necessary by the COVID-19 crisis. My claim is that hybrid synchronous teaching and learning is both possible and that it entails several significant benefits if designed taking all designable dimensions into consideration. My motivation for investigating the potentials of these types of hybrid learning spaces stems from a paradox with both practical and theoretical dimensions. You see, before the COVID crisis, our knowledge of the possibilities and limitation of synchronous hybrid teaching was based mainly on analysis of specially designed courses conducted by researchers and exclusively appointed faculty. And most of the existing literature was still exploratory in nature. As analyzed, uh, race and others concluded in their comprehensive study of the research done in a period from 2003 until 2017, the research was still in its infancy. Despite that the research was summarized on a positive note saying that all studies provide cautious optimism about synchronous hybrid learning, which creates a more flexible, engaging learning environment compared with fully online or fully on-site instruction. Quite contrary to these findings, one of the prominent voices in the Danish debate about the potential expansion of the use of synchronous hybrid teaching concluded that hybrid teaching is impossible. This critical and rejective conclusion was empirically supported in my own analysis of teachers' written reflections collected via the National Danish Teachers Training Programme in 2020. Even when a large proportion of the students participated online, the tasks and the social organizations were not, and I mean here by the teachers, were not systematically adjusted to the new and hybrid learning space. The hybridization seemed very theoretical and difficult to handle for most of the teachers and lectures. These experiences were documented worldwide and the research documented also new patterns of challenges and possibilities. So by focusing on the designable elements, the set design, the social design and the epistemic design, I've been able to extract principles for further development and theorizing. My review indicates that these findings are challenged by numerous design qualities that defines conditions and determines the level of success when it comes to the formation of learning spaces of these types. If we focus on the teachers, they do have more demanding technical and communicative tasks in synchronous hybrid learning spaces compared to other types of learning spaces. The distribution of responsibility connected to the tasks need to be adjusted and thought through accordingly to the relevant set design and the social design. So designing for hybrid learning in synchronous learning spaces is possible, but studies shows that the outcome is challenged by the qualities of the design of the learning space, this multifaceted interplay of the social, physical and epistemic dimensions. The social design would optimally support the epistemic design dimension by reducing the complexity. So all three designable elements or dimensions depend on the allocation of time and of knowledge performed by the teaching staff and the students in collaboration. The design process should follow principles where qualities like time, technology, space and collaboration and work-life balance is taken into consideration. If we follow the findings above, 
future work should preferably investigate first how the epistemic design dimensions affect the effectiveness and the learning outcomes in different configurations of hybrid learning spaces. In the literature reviewed, the epistemic design dimensions are mentioned, but they are very seldom given significant importance. Secondly, the possibilities of handling the trade-offs and the challenges by developing a practical method for involving students' ecology of resources and thereby providing teachers with tools for overcoming the barriers that exist for the successful implementation of synchronous hybrid teaching. As far as I can see, to overcome these barriers, these barriers for successful innovation and implementation that I identified, we need a better understanding of the possibilities of involving learners agency, supported by learning designs that enables teachers to gain insight into the students' zone of possibilities. This vision is illustrated in this figure, which shows a draft for a context-sensitive activity center design framework supported by the dimensions of ecology of resources. So hybrid learning spaces offer huge possibilities if designed well. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your comments and your questions. Synchronous. Thank you, Morten. Beautiful video. We need to learn from you how to create such a, a good presentation. Give a um, hybrid course soon. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm signed. Uh, questions, please, to Morten. So I have, I have a question since the, like in Israel, we have, the, I think in every college, in every university, uh, the institution builds so many hybrid classes uh, or yeah, the hybrid synchronous cl classrooms. What are the, like in terms of technology, did you find that uh, like some technology uh, help to simulate or to support, to support the design and the processes in, in it? Yes, indeed. I, I found that there's so many configurations also when it comes to, to the set design. And uh, one thing is, for example, a minor thing is the direction of the, the, this, um, the teacher. Which direction does the teacher look or the, the vision, so to speak, and, and uh, also how to use the students' own computers as, let's say, um, to let the student who is actually still uh, being uh, at home uh, mm -hmm. participating in, in, in group work all the time. So there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to, uh, to the technology, to the technological uh, setup. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're just the time passed. So I think we are moving to the, our next presentation. Uh, our next presentation is uh, brought by Mariano Val Vela Mazan, did I say it correctly? Okay, and uh, together with uh, Patricia Santos and Divinia Hernandez, uh, Mariano is a PhD candidate at Pompeii Fab Fabra University, and uh, he will speak about social emotional regulation in collaborative hybrid learning spaces or formal informal learning. Thanks. Being able to maintain a productive collaboration atmosphere in a group is a key skill that improves the performance of teams of young students. Previous research has suggested that, among other factors, this skill can be nurtured by being aware of social interactions within the members of the team and the successful regulation of potential emotional issues. In this chapter, we ask ourselves how social emotional regulation has been tested within the use of technology and what would be needed to further investigate to integrate this research into hybrid learning spaces. To begin with, we analyzed the literature about social emotional interactions and regulation and the research tools designed to support those processes. Social interactions have been studied extensively by Krayens and Kirchner. We follow the revised model of social interaction 
in which they proposed the concept of hedonicity, which expresses the degree of enjoyment and positive experience that collaborative learning tools provide. Concerning regulation, we learned that there are three modes, self, co, and socially shared regulation. And we chose to focus on co and socially shared regulation because those are the ones related to collaboration. We also found that there are two kinds of tools, scripting and awareness tools. We decided to focus on awareness tools because a central concern of our research is giving agency to students. If we want to foster students' agency, using scripting tools that somehow provide steps to follow is a contradiction. As a result of our analysis, we noticed that the literature observed and it studied groups only in formal settings, and that the tools were used in a specific moments predefined by researchers and not when needed during the natural flow of collaboration. Secondly, we problematized that social emotional regulation is potentially more challenging in hybrid contexts where formal and informal learning are mixed and issues may unfold at any time and more easily when there is no teacher supervision. In order to support and illustrate this problematization, we present the results of observation and questionnaires we carried out in a physically cited math gymkhana. This math gymkhana is an outdoor game where 15-year-old students must use clues and riddles to find and solve math problems that have been created by a teacher and have been located throughout the streets of one of the city's neighborhoods. In this gymkhana, the space is not just a container of the activity, but a fundamental part of the task that has to be accomplished because the problems refer to specific objects and places of the street. It is also important to highlight that the groups work on their own and teachers neither help nor supervise the groups. For example, we present the case of a girl who had an idea to solve one of the math word problems. She tried to explain it to the rest of the group, but she was not very self-confident, had a low self-esteem, and the rest of the group had a diminishing opinion of her. As a result of all this, she ended up discarding her contribution as nonsense, and the group lost the opportunity to learn and solve the task. As a conclusion, we discussed that there is a need to further investigate these contexts in order to better design tools that help students be aware and improve their regulatory skills in hybrid learning spaces. Thank you, Mariano. Okay, the gimmick, of course, it was taken to illustrate Oh, we have time to questions. Hmm. So, um, I wonder, Mariano, because you actually, you, you raise a question about whether hybridity is uh, different uh, per different subject um, uh, topic, subject topics. And I wonder if this is something that you thought of in the context of your research, whether you know the case that you described, whether it were, you saw something there that was specific to mathematics or you know, I mean, you, you talk about social emotional regulation, and for instance, um, I know that there's an issue with a gender issue in teaching mathematics. So, does this intersect with the hybridity, and uh, in what ways? Hmm. Mm, no, I was curious when I saw Morten's video, and I something that I have it, I've been also thinking about it myself because. Mm, I think hybridity is a great idea, but it, it, it may not work the same way um, 
depending on what you are trying to teach or what you are trying to learn. So maybe, but that, that's something that I have been personally thinking about it and how that could be, uh, how could we find like a way to do it? Uh, but I don't know, it, it was just a question just to open a little bit of a discussion if you had thought about it. I have asked uh, that question myself, but I don't have uh, a clear view. I just have like an intuition that there is something we have to uh, find out somehow or explore at least. <laughs> mm -hmm. Possibly this is a question for a longer discussion, Ishai mm -hmm. so, and Mariano. So maybe we can delay to the discussion at the end. Otherwise, we'll prolong this this uh, presentation. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank okay. You. So we are moving to our next uh, present presenters, uh, Jenny uh, Killen and Hank Kuhn. Jenny is a research associate with uh, the Laboratory of Anthropology in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Hank is the director of EDUCOR uh, BV, I'm not sure what it's, it's BV, uh, but you'll explain, and a chairman of Times Arrow. The full biography or a longer biography, please read in the website. So uh, Jenny, uh, Hank will present a co-creating future through virtual bars and the mystery so hello, I hope you can see the screen and hear the presentation. Here we go. Hello, my name is Jenny Quillian and you are? Hank Kuhn. So we've been given six minutes to talk to you about an article that we spent six months trying to work out. So we're not going to even attempt to convey to you the full contents of that article. You can read it yourself. We thought we would use these minutes to take a step back, to look more broadly at why we got into this adventure in the first place, and then to give you a few of the experiences we've had since we finished the article in trying to implement the ideas. So Hank, why did we get into this adventure? Well, we uh, realized uh, during the COVID-19 lockdowns that we're going to have to spend much more time online or in hybrid environments, whether it's for learning or for innovation or for co-creating uh, virtual futures in Bath. And uh, we know that with some of the primitive technologies which are at our disposal now, we can't really get a powerful experience. So we wanted to consider what could be changed in order to make for a much more attractive and effective experience. So to do that, we went to defamiliarization, that is uh, trying to take familiar things and think about them differently. It's, it's, a, it's a standard problem in design. When we have something that we know well and we move to a very different kind of situation, we, we tend to bring the past inappropriately with us. So the, the first cars were literally called horseless carriage and we took away the horse and kept the rest pretty much the same. When we were uh, experimenting with early aviation, the first idea was to make big wings and flap them. We did eventually figure out airplanes, but it wasn't by flapping great big wings. We had to think afresh. So, so Hank and I uh, turned to Japan, to Japanese vocabulary, which cuts up the world in a different way, comes from a different source. We said, what happens if we try to use a new vocabulary to think about things? So we looked at the Japanese vocabulary that has to do with shape. And rhythm. And harmony. And form. And see where, see where that uh, took us. So if you like, I'll go ahead and give one example. Do that, yeah. Um, so rhythm. We, we looked closely at the Japanese word ma, M-A. It's usually translated by gap or interval. It can be used both for space or for time. Um, and it's an important uh, aesthetic idea. So in a, in a painting, uh, the, the white spaces 
uh, around the, the objects in a speech, the way we, we pace our speech in a music, the, the sense of the pause. And um, in the Japanese aesthetics, uh, it, it, the ma is an important um, sentient kind of um, space. And the idea, it's great fun, the ideas go quite far. So in Japanese, a spy apparently is defined as someone who works in the ma. Actually, an adulterer is someone who operates in the ma. And an idiot is defined as someone who doesn't understand the ma. So, uh, so you see how extensive the ideas are. So I worked with a colleague who was teaching a class and we worked together to plan it out with a, a mi really mindful awareness of all the different rhythms that were involved, whether something should be synchronous or asynchronous, the kinds of the variation between the assignments, the ways in which Ma could hold together um, things of a disparate nature. And, and I have to say that we got much better results um, the, the time we spent doing it was productive and it was a more fluid experience for everyone. So that's, that's one experience with Kamal. So how about you? Uh, let me talk about uh, our experience with BA, B-A, uh, usually translated as shared context. And we took it in terms of the uh, evolving energy field of interactions between people and ideas and their purpose for being in a common space. Ba is in fact a commons. It's a conversational commons, an innovation commons, a challenge commons or learning commons. And what's important is people's commitment to being there with others, being there with their ideas, and being there with the purpose of using those ideas to co-create and apply new knowledge. And you can do that physically face-to-face, -face. sometimes it doesn't work, and you can do it online. And whether it's physical or online, what's important is the commitment to being there and co-creating that space. So although I've popped out of sight for a few seconds and Jenny has popped out of sight for a few seconds, we've created a bar and hopefully we've taken you into this bar with us when we tell the story and gotten you interested enough in these ideas so that you can continue to think about them and contribute by email uh, new ideas of your own to make this emerging field something of value to everyone. So that's our time. We'll take questions now or by email later. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Uh, such a lovely presentation. Question, please, Jenny Hank. I, 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 for one, will need time to kind of bridge the vocabularies, you know, between the sort of scientific jargon that we're so entrenched with. And, you know, where we've heard, you know, we've heard the zone of possibility and ecology of resources and signature pedagogies and, you know, epistemics. And then you bring us these, you no know, ma and ba and concepts that you said, well, it's usually translated as, but it's not really, right? Yeah, I think these things aren't, it's almost impossible to really translate them. So I think we'll need to kind of um, experience these concepts a bit more to, to see how they intersect with our vocabulary and challenge it. So thank you. Yeah. And, and read the chapter, of course, uh, which the preprint will be in the website. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So we are moving to our next presenter, uh, Anat Morevi and Lenny Scott Weber. Anat uh, is an experienced architect and a researcher, former from the Illinois Tech. And uh, Dr. Lenny Scott Weber is an author, key, keynote speaker, global consultant, and a pioneer 
in environment behavior research for educational practices. Uh, Anat will speak about creativity flourishes using hybrid spaces patterns. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. My name is Anat Moravi, and I will introduce chapter 13, Creativity Flourishes Using Hybrid Space Patterns. Just a small note that chapter 13 is part of a copyright PhD dissertation. Current architectural education design solutions are challenged by recent multiple cultural and educational paradigms shifts and the emphasis on collaboration and participatory creativity. This chapter aims to present a new relationship between architecture learning and creativity by introducing hybrid patterns of architectural affordances supporting creativity. Today, changes are slowly moving from passive and controlling solutions in the traditional settings to a more active and transformative solutions. The COVID-19 pandemic has implied our uh, awareness, amplified our awareness of how uh, we learn and teach and expanded the meaning of the where. The definition of space becomes broader and more hybrid. Current research indicates that space design can support and empower the present changes, offering more active learning and student-centered approaches. We see two main qualities in new learning environments today. The development of informal spaces between the typical classrooms and the idea of visibility of learning empowered by visual relations. This chapter, though, shade light on ways for those new architecture solutions to support the contemporary understanding of our creativity. According to Monterey and Donnelly, creativity is fundamental and evolving from contradictory performances as order and disorder, rigor and imagination, hard work and play, solitude and interactions and sharing. The critical tension between those contrasts suggests that creativity emerges on the edge of chaos while related to navigation between people, knowledge, and ideas. Therefore, this research was aimed to explore how architectural affordances can support those ideas. Technique number one indicate, um, includes content analysis of 16 awarded and known learning-driven environments from kindergarten to corporate offices. Two major patterns of co contradictory experiences were found among all examples. Formal, the blue, close defined with fixed solutions, and the informal, the turquoise, which was more open, visible, and movable with movable solutions. Post occupancy evaluation was the second main technique, including surveys, interviews, and observations of an awarded innovation center at IIT Chicago, Illinois. Finding indicates that hybrid spatial affordances as privacy versus public, concrete versus abstract, and the culture of convergent versus the culture of divergent are important affordances supporting the creative process. Therefore, insight number one suggests options moving from private to more public affordances and providing more shades between those conditions and by different levels of visual and audio connections, supporting conditions between separating and connecting. The next category is the strong cues fixed and suggesting behaviors on the left and the low cues on the right represent abstract settings, informal, movable, supporting more ad hoc, messy, dynamic and active learning activities. It is suggested that all regions be, be, become between passive and active spaces with different degrees of flexibility and architecture qualities are important to support collaborative creativity among individuals and teams and provide more choices and control. The third category represent hybrid cultures and it is related to the convergent spaces performing as anchors versus divergent spaces that act as network system associated with current social and educational discussions. Learning-driven spaces hosting creativity 
should be based on those two situational hybrid cultures representing two modes of thinking essential for creativity. Those hybrid culture comprise from an unplanned divergent spaces support a network of creative flow between ideas, people and knowledge by flex, fluid and free affordances and a network of planned convergent spaces anchoring and consolidating those creative thoughts and process by fixed anchors. Evidence indicates that positive effects of space on learning and create creativity may grow when space offer hybrid affordances supporting different learning cultures and learning behaviors. The system of hybrid architectural patterns then becomes an empowering tool for all users. More in chapter 13, we would like to thank you on behalf of Lanny Scott Weber and myself. Thank you very much, Anat. Okay, we have time for questions. I just like to say to my colleague, thanks, Annette, for doing such a great job. Yes, yeah, so again, I think, uh, you know, people who are used to talk or to, to see papers when educational theory will need some time to digest this. I think it was, you know, but, but I think it's very important for us to understand that, you know, we work in a space and that space dictates the kind of social interaction that we have. In fact, Morton uh, referred to this directly in his, in his talk. So we, we, we can't avoid it, right? Um, so thank you. Yeah, sorry. And yes, we clearly see the uh, interdisciplinarity of the book, uh, perspective from the architecture combined with a other perspective to hybridity from uh, bar to uh, social emotional to zone of possibilities uh, and to what is hybridity as well. Um, okay, if we don't have questions, so uh, let's continue uh, to our last presentation. Um, to Shai, uh, more Inat Gil, Yanis Dimitriadis, and Christian Kope. Uh, Ishai will present. Ishai is a senior consultant and researcher exploring the innovative ways of using technology to promote quality education. Uh, and he present the, the last chapter of the book, The Forward Looking. So thank you. I'll try to keep this quite short. Uh, I think uh, actually, you know, so we've seen a kind of a taster of the book, you know, as I not mentioned, you know, we had four editors, 33 authors, 17 chapters, 10 definitions of hybridity, at least I've, as far as I've counted. You've heard seven presentations of sample of these chapters and then you think, okay, what do I do in this? What, what do I take for this that I can actually put into practice tomorrow? So we thought, okay, we want to extract some predictive statements from these chapters. And we did it following a quasi-Delphi method, not strictly following the Delphi method, but improvising on top of it. Starting to, we, the editors went through the chapters, extracted predictive statements from them, reviewed them between ourselves, and then surveyed all the authors of the book asking them for each one of the statements to evaluate in terms of likelihood, impact, time frame that it would come into effect and confidence. If we could, we would refine and repeat this process, but you know, the book has to go to press at some point. So um, we kind of um, show just the initial, initial uh, results. And this is just an example of one of the pages in the, in the survey that we sent. So we had the statement and then the Likert scales and, and places for comments. So this is one of the first predictions that came up. And it says that, you know, hybrid is now the new normal, but also enables the new supernormal. Now, have actually, 
were all so engaged in hybrid teaching that pretty soon we'll stop calling it hybrid. That will be teaching. But this is hybrid mainly in the in the blended or high flex senses. And if you remember I not talk in the beginning, there are other levels of hybridity which are more exciting, more interesting. And as the the sort of the, the level, the lower level will become the norm, the mainstream on the fringes, you will have the space for the more fluid or hybridities. Um, the other prediction that had pretty strong agreement was the death of the lecture hall. It really makes no sense to have 500 people sitting in a, in, a, in a hall and one person talking at them. You could do it online. In fact, you know, this conference um, is an example. We could have held this conference and we held it for many years uh, face to face. And this year, last year, we couldn't because of COVID. This year, we were kind of uh, hesitant and we decided to keep it online because as as you know, as sort of uh, presentation delivery sessions go, it makes sense. But small classrooms will become more hybrid and more common, and and that kind of connects with what Anat was showing earlier about you know the need for flexible um, and dynamic classrooms where you have much stronger interaction. So uh, that connects to the next um, prediction, and again, that we will see spaces which are much more flexible, much more malleable, give more control to the educators and the learners in terms of designing and redesigning and reconfiguring them based on their needs. And this is, um, you know, in, in very plain words, I think it's uh, uh, a, a consequence of, of an ads talk. And and this is something that had pretty strong agreement within all the other uh, authors as well. However, some of the ex some of the predictions that we uh, extracted had much lower agreement, and I think it's worth mentioning them as well, because these are the kind of things that you hear in the research community. But when we look at them as practitioners, we see it's problematic. For instance. We claimed, and I think I've been, you know, talking about learning design for nearly two decades, and we claimed that we need to create uh, learning design partnerships where educators and researchers and space designers and content designers work together within a, um, a design discourse to really understand the problems as they emerge and, and, and find innovative solutions for them. Uh, the work that I did previously with John was precisely on that. And we, we well, but, but that seemed to get kind of a lot of disconsent about it, uh, probably because for cultural reasons, we know that it's very hard to implement this, even though we would all like to see this happen. Being more realistic, we're not sure how to get through the institutional barriers and the cultural barriers. Likewise, we were talking about how the classes or the spaces we work with we can get richer in terms of technology. We're talking about physical spaces, which now have our body with uh, speaking or showing technology, projectors, audiovisual devices, and so on. And if we could add them also with listening, seeing technology, technology that helps us collect data from the space and feed that data back to the educator, back to the learners, like we see in virtual learning spaces, that has a lot of value. Again, we see a lot of barriers for realization of this, both in terms of resourcing funding, but more so in terms of, of the learning and teaching culture. People don't really understand that if they have a camera in the room or microphone in the room, they can use it to improve their teaching and learning. So those are just kind of uh, five out of the predictions that we had. If I'd say you know, one of the challenges I see uh, with hybrid spaces in general is what I call the, um, the, the challenge in terms of sense of space, where I say space in terms of first 
what I call special text. The space, it's a physical space, is a text that we read. And, and again, if you think about the diagram that I not showed, when you see a room that's configured in a certain way, you immediately uh, understand, induce the, the social practices that will be embodied in that space. And in hybrid or, or, or virtual spaces, we don't have that reading. We don't know how to behave because the space is very elusive. We don't have the possibility to diagnose, to understand, you know, if we were sitting in the same room, I would see your eyes and I would see if you're nodding off or you're looking at me uh, fascinated by my talk. Here, I don't have it. Um, the other thing is it's harder to foster participation. And again, we've seen it in, the, in this uh, session as well. It's harder to foster collaborative work. It's harder to maintain engagement. So all of these are, I think, key challenges that we will need to address in the future. Um, that's it for me. And I think we have a few minutes left for an open discussion. So Einat, I'll, I'll uh, return the, the, uh, the, the session to you. Okay, and, and first uh, question to you, Ishai. If there are questions to uh, this chapter, the presentation of Ishai, please do. Ah, yeah, thanks. Um, that's really interesting. Thanks, Yashai. And um, in terms of, this, I like your acronym at the end, by the way, uh, Prediction 3, Learning Design Partnerships. Um, uh, you said there's some um, discontent. It's hard. Would you like to, could you elaborate on what you've found out since we last worked together a couple of years ago in the UK, in Bristol, nice part of the world is where I live. Um, can you elaborate on that a bit more, What you've, as things have been going on? Oh, not no, uh, well, well, actually, if you think about the work that we did there and with the, you know, the, I, I think the Layers Project, we put a lot of effort into yeah. creating uh, that um, multi-log between different stakeholders yeah. within um, a, a design discourse. And we managed to get that going because we put all that energy into it but they didn't manage to make it self-sustained, yeah. right? And if you think about the institutions in which we all work, it's very hard to instigate this kind of design level discourse. Yeah. Now, you know, I think Einat is, is now setting up a new center at, at her college, which is trying to get that to happen there. But, you know, we've, we've all been saying, we need to talk design for many years and people think we're talking about color choices right so you know we we need to 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 i, I don't know maybe nowadays um there's more openness to thinking about to talking with design in general and design thinking is something that people know about a bit more but but still i think it's uh it's a challenge. And, and I think, you know, if, if you hear people here, even in this session, bringing in these very diverse perspectives, even for us, it's an effort. And, and to be honest, maybe not everyone is willing to make that effort unless they really have to. Um, it also relates to what uh, the comment that uh, Lenny made here about the death of the lecture hall. And you're right, we've been saying this for years right? In that sense, you know, COVID-19 kind of is almost a gift. I mean, it's a horrible gift, you know, millions of deaths. But um, in that sense, it, it, it forced institutions to kind of accept changes that were long coming. So, uh, so maybe this, you know, maybe again, the, the things breaking down, you know, as you say, never waste a good crisis. Maybe when things break down, it will finally force people to understand that they need to get into a multidisciplinary, multivocal design discourse. If I could pop in for a minute, uh, this is Lenny. Um, yeah. one, yes, of the, one of the research uh, components that I've done for many years is when you're talking about this kind of change, it really relates to the situational change, the situational culture. And to your point that you were just talking about, unless you are on that site or in that district that is trying to move change, you have to kind of start from the bottom, 
the teacher classroom area, as well as you have to start from the administrative level and bring those situations and that culture together to understand what is the learning experience going to be here? How might we generate a hybrid connection? How might we generate a more engaged connection, a more agile learning environment? And then what do those spatial clues add to that in order to be able to bring it to bear um, to have some reality to what that new learning and advanced learning might be for both the student and the educator. Yes, uh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. I think uh, leading innovation in organizations, whether it's a school or a college, university, is supporting the, the teachers, supporting the students in this, uh, whether through design or through workshops and interacting with the space, uh, whether it's the physical and hi hybrid or online uh, is a, a really important uh, uh, and something not to be taken for granted. Uh, So Shai, how how are we are on time? I think uh, actually but we we are. I mean, officially we're over time. There's you know about seven minutes until the next session starts. So you know we should give people a quick break. But um, um, you know I feel that we've been talking a lot, and hopefully this has been interesting for for the other participants. Um, I don't know if if somebody wants to jump in with a question or a comment, somebody who's not involved in, the, in writing the book, then it would be great. And also I put a question in terms of uh, what do people take home? And uh, so this is an important question for us all, also for the presenters, by the way. And, <clears throat> Yeah. So in, in I, I definitely take home that, you know, uh, even though I you know, read the book as an editor, I think I, I need to now read it again. I think, uh, you know, and it's interesting how just seeing the people on one frame, uh, almost as if they were all in the same room, and suddenly you see all the connections between the chapters. Um, you know, but you say, how didn't we notice that? So, uh, so for me, that's interesting. Um, yeah. My takeaway is that uh, there's a lot of interesting material out there. And as I put the question in the chat, are we talking about the same things, similar things, different things, when we each coin a phrase? And, uh, mm. and cite uh, similar or the same research. And it would be very nice to have other online sessions together to uh, explore all of these emerging fields. Uh, since fortunately, uh, as was pointed out, uh, the lecture hall is dead. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's uh, that theoretically what we mean and also practically where we are, what can we take it to? Uh, just to say, I followed that after the Delft conference, which was fascinating. I went and met Jenny uh, in Amsterdam, and I had some great conversations. and And I'm, I, I was great to do the book chapter, but it's great to be here, hearing all the perspectives. And I would, I would um, follow up um, with what Frank's saying here. We need, we need to have more online chats, so whatever kind of chats to to refine our understanding, because I I, even if it's hard work, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. I think it's definitely worth doing. So uh, yeah, definitely. I'm glad uh, glad I turned up today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. I yeah. think really we need to take a five minute break before the, the final closing session. Uh, so um, yeah. hopefully we'll see some of you there. And, uh, and yes, we should find other opportunities to meet again. Thank you everyone for uh, coming. Yeah, thank you very, very much for everyone to join. See you in the next book and the session. Is